Welcome to AP Statistics. In this video, we're going to talk about dot plots. Dot plots are a great way to explore quantitative data. So let's dive right into it. So uh, remember, what is a dot plot? So first of all, they got to have number lines, right? You got to have a number line and you have to have your number line divided into intervals that go up by the same value. Okay, so maybe you're going to decide, hey, I'm going to have my intervals start at 80 and go up by 5. 80, 85, 90, 95, or you can go up by 6, or you go up by 2, or you go up by 10. you got to be consistent with your intervals. Now, in a dot plot, dots are indicated, are used to indicate a value's position on the number line. So every dot that you see indicates a specific value, a specific data point, and what its value is based on where you put it on the number line. So typically dot plots are best for discrete data. Remember discrete data is data that is listable, meaning that you could actually make a list of all possible outcomes for that variable. So we're typically thinking whole numbers here. It doesn't have to be that way, but it does make making dot plots really easy. So rather than bore you to keep talking about dot plots, let's just look at some examples to see how easy they are to understand. So here we looked at 14 kids and every kid was asked two questions. How many hours a week do they exercise and how many hours a week do they play video games? So on top we see the blue dots. So again, got a number line. I actually went by ones, even though I didn't label the one and the three and the five, there's little marks there that represent them, even though I only labeled the two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14. Like you get it, right? And again, this dot right here, right there, that represents one kid who exercised zero hours last week. I mean, it's that simple. Now, if multiple kids exercise two hours a week, well, then we just stack the dots on top of them so we actually see three kids exercise for two hours a week. Pretty simple, not too bad. Then in green, we have the number of hours they play video games. Once again, we see one kid that played zero hours of video game. We saw another kid who played 14 hours. Now remember, anytime you look at graphs of quantitative data, you want to talk about shape, center, and spread. So for the exercise, I'd probably say it's a little bit skewed right. I do see the majority of the data on the left-hand side and less to the right. So that's that kind of skewed right. Less data to the right, more data to the left. Um, for the video games, I'd see it's kind of symmetric. I mean, a little bit. It's not perfectly symmetric. I mean, you're never going to see perfect symmetry in the real world. But we see that, you know, the data is kind of even, right? There's no big peaks in there. Um, we also see that both are similar in spread. Exercise is 0 to 12. Video games is 0 to 14. So the video games do have a slightly larger spread of the data. And then we also talk about the center. You know, if you had to give one number. So exercise, I'd probably say somewhere around two to three hours is what most kids get. Yeah, some got more, some got less. But in terms of a typical center, just using my eyeballs, you know, two, three hours. Video games, God, my eyeballs see that's right a lot higher. Maybe around nine to 10 hours is a typical amount of hours a kid plays video games. Here's another dot plot. Instead of using dots, these little asterisks, that's cool too. So a college professor examined 32 students on a recent exam. Scores range from 64 to 95. So we put a dot. Now notice here what we did here. First off, notice how we switch it. It's now vertical. That's something you could do if you would like. But notice we did something else here. So we actually went by fives, but we didn't show that we went by fives, but we did. So when you see two sixes, that means that the first is for the bottom of the 60s because it did say the scores range from 64 to 95. So we know that the six is actually a 60, right? And the fact that we have two sixes means that the bottom one is for 60 to 64 and the top one is for 65 to 69. So that's what kind of you need to understand when you see one of these split split up and you see the sixes are split up and so forth. So a little weird. So I wanted to show you this one. So again, you know that two kids scored in the bottom 60s. Now we don't know exactly what they are. It could be like a 64 and a 64. Well, actually it did say the scores ranged from 64 to 95, right? So both of these scores would have to be a 64 because to be in the bin for 60 to 64, well, there's only two of them and the lowest one is 64. So maybe we should look at this next bin here. This is for the 65 to 69 group. And again, we know two kids got scores in that range, but we don't know exactly what their scores were. Like it could have been a 67 and a 68, or it could have been two 68s or 66 and 69. So, you know, that's a drawback of doing a dot plot this way. But again, we're just trying to convey the distribution of the data. We see that scores range from 60 to 90s, and we see that the majority of kids scored probably in the 80s to low 90s. That's where the majority of kids score. 
and um, you know maybe in the low 90s is which was the dominant peak we see that dominant peak in the low 90s so again when you talk about your data you want to make sure you talk about things like that right like the distribution what values were there well the values were from 64 to 95 okay which were most often well scores in the upper 80s lower 90s were most often I could see that even though I don't know the individual scores I could see that coming through in terms of shape I would say this graph is skewed to the left if I turn my head I see that the are there are more scores to the right so skewed left kind of looks like this where we have more data to the right to the larger numbers less data to the left smaller numbers so that would be skewed oh, did I say skewed right I hope I don't know what I said Hopefully I said skewed left. This is skewed left. Skewed left is when you see more, just like your left foot, right? Your bigger toe is on the right, smaller toes are on the left. Skewed left, like your left foot. So again, what that means is that most people scored in the higher values, less kids scored in the lower values. All right, here we see what we call um, stacked um, box, or um, box, what am I talking about here? Stacked uh, dot plots. Kind of nice to compare. So here we have two groups of kids. A group of kindergartners, that was A, a group of first graders, that was B, and we had every kid throw a ball and we measured how far they could throw that ball in inches. And we see the results. So some, some things I would definitely say here were, you know, both actually look really symmetric, right? That's one thing that they have in common. Both kind of have this, their peaks in the middle and a little bit less to the left, a little bit less to the right. Uh, this one, same thing, kind of peak in the middle, less to the left, less to the right. Now, A is more spread out because it has some lower values all the way down here, maybe 120 and another value up here at 155. So it's definitely more spread out, but they're both symmetric in nature when we think about the shape of these graphs. All right, what about the center? Well, I'm gonna say for the kindergartners, they're looking to be about 135. That's kind of a good center, right? Some data below, some data above. For the first graders, they do look to be a little bit higher, maybe 137, 138. So we do see they have a slightly higher center. And with dot plots, we could just use our eyes to see these very, very simple ideas. And uh, we already talked about spread, right? We said A is more spread out. So, you know, a lot of really simple things that you could gather just by looking at this. Um, but again, remember, what does each dot represent? Like, for example, this dot right here represents one kindergartner who threw the ball 145 inches. Boom. There you go. It's pretty simple four kindergartners through 140 inches. So four kids end up that exact same spot. All right, here is another one. This actually came from an experiment. We talked about experiments before. So an experiment was conducted to see if a new preservative can help uh, can be placed on strawberries before they are frozen to help them from becoming discolored. You know, when you freeze strawberries, sometimes they get all gross and ugly looking. So 50 random strawberries were used, 25 randomly re re uh, selected to receive the new preservative. The remaining 25 got nothing. All strawberries were frozen at the same temperature for zero degrees at one week. Their discoloration was measured at the end on a score, uh, scoring system of one to 10, where one was very little discoloration. So that would be a good, one would be good. 10 would be very discolored. They'd be like almost black strawberries. Nobody wants to eat those. So, you know, we look at the data, we want to talk about it again. For the treatment group, it looks pretty symmetric. Typical centers are right around a discoloration of five, which is pretty pretty standard, right? Um, not too bad, but not, not too great either. Uh, whereas the control group, the group that got no preservatives, we could clearly see that their center is a little higher, maybe somewhere between six and seven. So, you know, based on this data, if you did not get the preservatives, those strawberries typically did have higher discoloration ratings, which means that they were worse. But I don't know, is there a significant difference here? I mean, even the group that got the preservative had a couple with really high ratings, so that doesn't bode well for this new preservative. But the point is not about experiments right now. The point about is understanding what you see in a dot plot. I would probably say the control group might be slightly skewed to the left, a little bit more data on the right, less data on the left there, a little bit skewed left. All right, and here's another one we're gonna take a look at. A company that produces tiny ball bearings selected a random sample of real small, tiny little ball bearings, little round um, cylinder uh, sphere little balls, right? And they measure the diameter of each ball bearing in centimeters. So this is one where we do see that the values are decimals here. So a little bit more complicated to look at, like a lot of data and with the decimals, they're, they're very small. So, you know, for example, this is one centimeter and then this is 1.01 centimeters. So these ones in between had been really small, like maybe right here would be one point. 005 centimeters, right? So a little tougher to decide, but again, you know, 
the point of dot plots is maybe you don't want to know all the individual values. You just want to have a nice look at your distribution. So what would I say about this um, dot plot? Hey, the, the ball bearings range from around 0.95 centimeters to as high as 1.05 centimeters. Data looks pretty spread out. The majority of ball bearings were from 0.99 to 1.01. A lot of ball bearings there. Um, the shape is very symmetric, right? We see the data peaking in the middle, going left and going right. Not equally, but close. So kind of symmetric. If we were to fold the data in half, it would kind of match up. And then we see that a typical size of a ball bearing is probably just under one centimeter in diameter. That'd be a pretty typical center there for this data, a little bit under one centimeter. So that's really the point of these is just to get some quick knowledge about your distribution, right? And remember, what's a distribution? What values your data takes on and how often it takes them on. So I could clearly see that by looking at this picture. And here's one last one to take a look at. So a sample of people was asked how much their last, sorry for the typo there. How, oh, no, it's not. How much the last vehicle they purchased was. So these are in thousands of dollars. So here we don't see a ton of data because our samples were very small. But we do see that for the women, a couple were around $20,000 and same with the men. So these two dot plots are very similar. I would say both are probably a little bit skewed to the right where we see the majority of data on the left, less data to the right. And we definitely see a big spread here, right? Some cars range from as low as maybe $16,000 to as high as $46,000. Again, what was the actual price of this car right here? Well, I don't know, between 30 and 35,000, $33,000, $33,250. I don't know the exact price of that car just by looking at the dot plot. And that's okay. I get a feel for the distribution. The cars ranged from as low as around 16 to as high as around 46, $47,000. But the majority of people I surveyed were near $20,000 for their last vehicle purchase. So I get a real good feel of the data. And when you're talking about explaining a graph or describing a graph, that's really all you have to do. You don't have to really give big specific numbers. We're not asking you to find an average yet or a median. Like don't even think about that right now. We're gonna get there very soon. We're just trying to get a quick talk, a quick glimpse at what the data is doing.